always think the Wilson Room it is, is a reflection of what we hope to be um, as an organization, and that's a, a community space. And it's used for many different things, uh, meetings, uh, music recitals, uh, performances, author readings, and of course, art exhibits. And one of the things that uh, we, we do have an art exhibit, uh, exhibit committee, and that is composed of one library board member and uh, members of the local art, uh, artist community. So once a year, um, the, uh, any artists who would like to, or groups of artists who would like to uh, perhaps um, exhibit here, uh, bring in their works, and uh, the art committee reviews them, and then um, we, we display them. And, and it is a very well-used service. Uh, we, we usually have um, queues of people waiting to be able to uh, exhibit here at the library. And it's one of the, um, something that we, we bring in a lot of people who, who look forward to the, to the exhibits. Um, so the art exhib exhibition policy is that we are, you know, have to provide free space, and that it is again local art. So that is something that we, we don't bring in other arts from, from other places. Um, and because it is such a multi-purpose room, we do ask when people rent it for different purposes that they understand that the that it comes with the art exhibit, and that they, they're not allowed to change it or to alter it. Um, I'll kind of go back to 2011, and this was before I was chief librarian, but I was working here as the manager of children's teens and rural services. Uh, we had an art, ex uh, an art ex exhibition, and there were about four or five news, female news. Um, they were all grouped in this area, and one Sunday afternoon we had a music recital. Um, the library was closed. Uh, the music teacher came in and saw, of course, and of course, all the chairs were facing this way, and so they all, you know, mom and dad and grandparents all, you know, were staring at them as, you know, their child was up doing their recital. Um, because of that, we, we ended up getting a complaint from the music teacher. Uh, we also received a number of complaints um, from parents. Um, it was beyond trying to get a photo of your child without also capturing the news, and I can imagine some grandparents looking at the photo and thinking, that in the back, you know, behind the child. Um, so um, they were, I guess some of the concerns we heard um, was you would hang that in an elementary school, and I'm not sure I, you know, what they would hang in an elementary school, but as a public library, we had a different view of what should be up here. Um, they also kind of said what was appropriate to be in a public library. Were, were the news, you know, an appropriate um, piece of work to, hot, to, to put in the library? Um, and again, in a room that is used by different, very, you know, different groups, different age, ages. Uh, we also heard that um, the audience was composed of community members from different cultural, um, ethnic, and religious backgrounds, and that if many were not offended by the art, were at least uncomfortable exposing their children to it. So in response to those concerns, the library board reviewed the existing policy, and that was a lot of research looking at what other public libraries did, what other public galleries did. So we ended up with um, the underlying principle that the library provides access to a wide range of expressions of imagination, knowledge, creativity, intellectual activity, and thought in a welcoming and supportive um, environment. And I won't read the entire policy to you, I promise. Um, and that the library supports, and this is part of our collection development, uh, the Ontario Library Association's statement on the intellectual rights of individuals. Of the individual. Um, the policy also stated that the library strives to create a welcoming environment for visitors of diverse ages and background, and that the library retains the right to determine the suitability of any proposed exhibit for display in its premises and has final authority over the review, selection, and arrangement of all public exhibitions on its premises, and in particular, exhibits must be reviewed within the context of the public space and its users. So, um, having passed the policy, um, how are we supposed to operationalize it? And we sure found out in May of this year um, when the Kingston Art Council had their annual jury exhibition. Um, so, the, council, the King's, uh, King, Kingston Arts Council show is chosen by a jury. Um, the members of the, the library board's art committee don't see it. Um, and so, um, we weren't aware. Um, what was going up on the walls until it was actually had been on display. Um, so it turns out that 
May of this year, we had a number of music recitals and other children's uh, programs. And because of the concerns raised in 2011, the library board representative of the committee was consulted, and the board as a whole. And I guess we ended up calling Ray to say, we're in a bit of a dilemma. How do we balance the you know kind of people who are coming in here for one purpose and are being exposed to something that they might not be comfortable with? So uh, we consulted with Greg, who was going to consult Margaret, and asking that if we could remove the paintings during children's programs. Um, the thing was, we were concerned as I thought moving the artwork as Margaret was. We didn't want to damage it. Um, and it was also the logistics of getting our staff to take it up and take it down in a timely way. Um, and so Margaret ended up bringing in a cloth and we did cover the artwork during, only during children's programs. Just and a small part of it, perhaps. <laughs> yes. Did anyone send you the cloth? Yes. <laughs> well, I'm sure people did. Oh, yeah. 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 And, and a sign posted explaining why the artwork was being cut. Um, the interesting thing, the artwork
what was going on, but this uh, panel gave me a chance to go back and revisit another controversy involving censorship in Kingston, and may be familiar to some of you and maybe new to others. Uh, so I just thought it would be interesting to take a few moments to, to look at this history. Um, so this is a, a quote that uh, was in the media back in the early 1970s. This was a great moment for Kingston. It was heading towards 1973, which was Kingston's tercentenary. Uh, there was a lot of enthusiasm about uh, Kingston's history, but also its, its place moving forward into the future. And there was a very active tercentenary committee that wanted to do something significant in relation to that anniversary. And uh, one of the key players in that group was Michael Davies, who was then the publisher of standard and he wanted to bring public art to Kingston and he wanted to do it in a way that spoke to what was the most contemporary work happening at that time. So this was a quote from Alderman George Webb at that time in relation to the first public work that got created in the lead up to the Tristan Turn and which we all know as Time by Kozel Abul, which is down on the waterfront of Breakwater Park. Uh, this is a fascinating piece. This was um, a gift from the province of Ontario. It was done through a public art commission. It was a competition and caused a little one. And the intent was to have an artist signify the history of Kingston through a work. And Kozlo was very well known at that time for his minimalist sculpture that he was doing, largely in stainless steel. And uh, I won't go into all the history, but something that I thought was really fascinating about this is that uh, he worked with a lot of local resources, including Alcan, and he made a shift from working from in stainless steel as his chosen medium to aluminum, and worked with their scientists to come up with material that would be appropriate to this piece. So there was a lot of effort that went into it, and I think it's really interesting that the political reaction at that time was that it's something that looked like it was on a scrap heap. Um, so time went in, and the next piece that was gonna come along, this was, starting to get into some governmental intervention and what Kingston would be able to see in terms of public art. So, uh, if you want to press the button again, Mayor George Spiel at that time said when he saw the design for the next work that if this is what's coming to Kingston, then just, I'm going to stop it. Uh, if you want to go to the next slide. Uh, that piece is pollution that we're all familiar with. A commission by Yvonne Kozik that was a gift from the Quebec government. Uh, and even at this point, it went ahead as a public commission, but um, the hue and cry meant that this plan to do a five-piece um, sculpture park along the water's edge started to change. And so rather than locate this, pe this piece along Great Water Park, it got moved further to the east where we see it close to Richardson Beach. And some of you might recall this version of pollution from uh, a, few, uh, a couple of years after it went up. Uh, this was an intervention by three, surprisingly enough, three professionals at Kingston General Hospital. They went in in the covered night one night and uh, revamped this work of pop art, literally as pop art. And this led to quite a bit of discussion in the public realm. Go to the next slide. Uh, so obviously picked up in the local paper. Uh, the reaction to the uh, modification to the sculpture was actually very pro the modification, it seemed at the time that the community was much happier with the pop cans than they were with the pollution uh, motif. And so uh, if you read through that, that article, uh, it talks about they, they prompted a phone-in sort of poll and, and the majority of people, something like 200 and, and uh, I think it was about 25 people all said they preferred it this way and that they felt now that the sculpture was their own and could comfortably represent Kingston. And there was very few voices that sort of said that this was um, you know, going against the moral rights of the artist. So again, in the paper, in the next slide, uh, there was a, an op-ed piece with Barry Thorne on one side congratulating who we refer to as the Three Musketeers for uh, striking a blow for freedom and making a sculpture of their own. And on the opposition, there was Jennifer McKendry, a local uh, art historian and writer who uh, basically called this an act of censorship on the part of the artist's intent with the work. Uh, so you have the government imposing censorship in the kind of work that can uh, be presented, and you have the public coming forward censoring with their response to what uh, was acceptable. So an interesting dynamic at that time. On the next one. Uh, so the third piece that uh, got realized in the last of the five proposed pieces is 
10 meters of uh, works. Uh, Tetra, again, was supposed to be part of Breakwater Park, but then got moved over to the Olympic Harbor uh, for the 1976 Olympics, which went to the next one. So those are the three pieces that we still see in Kingston uh, that were, again, meant to be clustered together, but are spread further apart along the waterfront. The logic being, it seems, that if you put them farther apart, they're not quite as offensive as they might be. <laughs> uh, next slide. So the Agnes Center and Art Center brought together uh, through this public competition partly funded by the Canada Council, 20 maquettes, 20 proposals for public artworks in Kingston to add to a discussion about contemporary sculpture in the city at that time. And four sculptures were uh, won out of that competition, only one of which is still available to be seen in Kingston. The lower piece um, by Claude Roussel Atlantic has been temporarily removed from its site down by the Stella Buck building. The University asked it to be removed when they started construction on the Isabel Bader Center for the Performing Arts. We're trying to figure out an approach to whether or not it should be restored and relocated. The other piece by Gino Lortini used to be in Market Square and was taken out with the restoration of Market Square. And that's before my time. I'm not sure what's happened to it, so I need to do some So I just, it's one of our challenges obviously at the city and I think it's a great topic to be talking about today, what happens when you're dealing with issues of the public realm and public patronage in the form of taxpayer monies being used to create public artworks and it being facilitated through a public administration system like the city of Kingston, for example. And the last slide I have is one that I came across when I was doing, or am doing research. Um, Greg has made reference to the fact that the city is in the process now starting the process of, of um, stakeholder consultation and how this is going to play out. And this is from a resource by Daniel Hunting where I mean, you can almost think when you go from A1 to C3 that you're going to get increasing amounts of controversy as, as pieces that are being created um, move from being publicly funded and public, or, sorry, privately funded and privately presented to something that's wholly publicly funded and, and publicly presented. So not to say we don't have a challenge, and I'm Sutherland's painting is a great example of the different types of censorship that can exist. You know, on a personal level, I was at the opening and sort of said to my wife, said, I really like that, I think you should buy it. My wife's big response was, you know, a picture of Harper's not coming to the market. So <laughs> <laughs> and so I thought, okay, well, that's fine. I sort of thought, well, I'll, you know, I'll put it up in my office in Toronto. And, uh, and then, of course, as soon as I thought about doing that, I realized that, well, actually, no, there's all this workplace legislation now that if anybody in the office feels uncomfortable because that picture is hanging up in my office, I've got a problem. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I started, so, sorry, I started having a lot of that, and then I said, but if, you know, but then if I have to say, we then went away the next day on the holiday, so I forget where. I missed the whole kerfuffle of the papers, but when I got back, I decided, I sort of said to Julia, I sort of said, you know, I, I think we really should get that painting anyway, so I called up Mary Sue or anything, I know quite well. And, and in fact, that painting just, you know, in the background, that painting had been exhibited the year before in Toronto, never a fuss. It had hung up in Mary Sue's living room, which is visible from the street in Toronto, never a fuss. But, so with it, that, that, that said, it never really made it into the press either, so it's a great example of publicity as effect. But anyway, so I called up Mary Sue, and she sort of said, well, actually, you, you, you obviously have been missing what's happening, and she proceeded to tell me that this, I think, was on Friday morning, when she was saying, I've got a whole bunch of bits coming in, and you this and that, so it was quite an interesting situation where you know, something how notoriety helps, helps market for sure. So anyway, so that's you know some of my background on it. I guess uh, Greg was hoping as a lawyer I might comment on things from a legal perspective. And uh, you know, I used to see these in my personal views, and, and as a lawyer I love commenting on things I know nothing about. <laughs> so, uh, but certainly, you know, when I heard the, for the first time, for example, the library's policy, I 
be frank, I was a little shocked because you know, as soon as you accept responsibility for what's going on your walls, you're accepting the liability that goes with it. And uh, normally, you know, in this day and age, people take the Google approach, which is, hey, we provide the forum, but we're not responsible for the content. And we rely on curators and juries to make that decision, and they screw up, go after them, but hey, we're just a public forum, we're not responsible for content. So I was a little surprised to hear both that they wanted to take on that liability at the same time concerned because you know, it's, you know, we normally expect art to be curated by people who you know, may know something about art, although at the same time, you know, whether it's a curation or a jury process, it's still another form of censorship. And uh, so, in a sense, but at least it's censorship of people who both are knowledgeable on the topic and uh, can bring something educational to, to the piece. To, to decide against something is not to censorship, not to censorship nearly in the way that we're talking about. Oh, there are different forms of censorship. Quite, yeah, that's why I just objected to using the word because what we're talking about, in fact, is selection or exclusivity or, or predilection or you know, the uh, operation of personal taste or something, which, as you know, is a big can of worms. And nobody can define or discuss that. Um, I was just sitting here getting annoyed, and I thought there's no reason uh, my wife warned me about bringing my easily ignited sense of annoyance to any discussion like this. <laughs> it never does any good, I suppose. But, you know, the whole business of public sculpture drives me so crazy. Um, public sculpture is almost always terrible. Almost without exception. And it's not surprising to me that the public, whom we like to think we are superior to, because they say, what is it? I don't understand it. And we say, well, we do. We're familiar with the arts. The public probably has this <laughs> a good position when they say, you know, what the hell is this stuff? Um, mostly, it doesn't relate to the public at all. Uh, the public, by and large, does not come directly from an education in the arts. They do not, they do, they do not have a context in which to put it. And often, it's just really bad. The three, the three works I saw are just terrible. Um, as for the nude in here, um, it was so funny. And it, it occurred to me that if we had mounted Titian's uh, The Venus of Urbino on that wall, it would have been the same number of letters and upset, because there you had a supine a nude, albeit female. Um, I suppose the idea of a female nude uh, is slightly more uh, conventional in our history than a male nude. Uh, nevertheless, um, there would have been the same outcry had any nude anything been on the wall. And I remember during that exhibition, the jury process, I was part of the jury, uh, I didn't want the piece in it, in the show, because I thought it popped off out of the rest of the show. And, was so uh, singular in all sorts of ways that it didn't integrate well into the show. But I was told this would be a great shame not to have it in here. Um, Greg and the other jurors said, oh no, we have to have it. It'll be controversial. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and so right. it was. And so it was. However, uh, because I don't give a rat's ass what the public thinks about anything, I think controversy is wonderful. And if people are sending emails and letters saying, how dare you, what about Prime Minister, what about Premier, uh, Prime Minister Harper's mother <laughs> and children, that's just too pathetic to take seriously. And so, you know, I think they just, people have to get over themselves, that's all. I, I resent, I, I resist in an unnuanced, monolithic, and therefore uninteresting way, any kind of censorship whatsoever, because I cannot stand the idea that someone somewhere thinks that he or she or they have the right to tell me what I can see, hear, listen to, or anything else. And so I have no, uh, I have no, I haven't got a, I'm, I haven't got an electron in my body that is in favor in any way of censorship. One of the things that's wrong with uh, the cultural landscape at the moment is there's no good education uh, for young people growing up about, there's no cultural context for them to put things in. There's no way for them to understand what a nude might be and how it may not be any different from a vase of flowers or a brick or a mountain and it has to be put in some kind of context. This pathetic situation that you described in Hamilton uh, where two artists were censored out of this sort of a please decorate a refrigerator for us uh, competition. Uh, this one woman censored, presumably, I haven't seen the work, because she depicted the, uh, a, a nursing mother on her fridge, which, when you think of it, is sort of witty. I mean, the fridge is sort of nurturing, too, in a way, except that it isn't ideologically perfect, because the fridge is cold, 
and a woman's dress is presumably not. And so there's a disturbing uh, slippage there. But in fact, it isn't without wit. On the other hand, it, don't you find it absolutely appalling that anyone on Earth today, thousands of years after the discussion began, could still find that there would be something disturbing about uh, a, nursing, a nursing mother? I don't, don't we all see women nursing children on trains and so on? I don't think anybody's upset about that, are they? Yes. I find it very difficult to understand why a breast is okay in bed, but not on a poster or not on a refrigerator. <laughs> seems very peculiar to me. Society doesn't like artists very much at all. <laughs> and there's no way to pretend that they do or that they're going to. Artists are, in our culture, an irritation. And the only artists in our culture, which is money-based, who have any respect are people like Jeff Koons or, or uh, Damien Hirst, who make billions of dollars on what they do. And the reason they have respect is because of what they represent in terms of buying power, in terms of, in terms of prestige uh, uh, as a maker of collectible things. Artists in general, who have long ago, I think, given up the sweet, charming, exciting energy of making things for things' sake, but who wish to succeed in the marketplace are just an irritation. Everybody hates them. And I don't think there's any reason for them to go on whining about it. <laughs> just explain it. That's all I have to say, right? And so the thing that really kicked off uh, the Harper government becoming aware of me uh, was a letter that I wrote to him in 2008. It's called Dear Prime Minister. You've seen the cover of it there. And Basically, I was just asking him to consider a carbon tax <laughs> and to make polluters pay. You say the other parties are dangerous because they will tax polluters. But if we don't tax polluters, who will pay to clean up the mess? And the thing is that maybe my work was more frightening to him than, or to the Harper government at large, um, than other, you know, sort of written works or, which were saying the same thing. But the fact is, I was doing it in a way that was accessible and fun, and that people would like to hang on their wall and read the stories, and that they could, um, they could understand it. Uh, I'd say that I'd been blacklisted by the Harper government. Uh, they intervened behind the scenes in what was supposed to be a 20-city European uh, tour of my art. Uh, the government was, uh, had agreed to give a pittance, a total pittance, 5,000 bucks, towards the show. And uh, the, um, we've got, I've got the access information documents which show that they actually did agree. But then when they found out that it was my art, they quickly pulled it back and said, no, 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 we're not supporting her, okay? And so we thought, well, that's fine, who cares? 5,000 bucks, we're just gonna go ahead and do the show anyway, we've got private funding, so we don't give a damn. But the thing was, they didn't stop there. They continued to interfere behind the scenes. And the Canadian Embassy in Croatia actually um, contacted the show curator and warned her not to show my art. And they influenced people within the Canadian Embassy that I had contacted um, to see if I could have uh, like a press event, which I would pay for myself at, the, at any of the Canadian embassies in the 20 cities. And so it wasn't going to cost them anything, no taxpayer dollars were involved. And they said, no, you can't do that. So here we have the um, Scott Hetherington, who is the ambassador for the Baltic states. And he ha is writing to a huge long list of people at different uh, Canadian embassies in Europe. And I've obtained this um, through access to information. In fact, I've got over 1,500 pages of conversations related to me from the uh, government. And in this one, he, he's speaking to the trade uh, commissioner in uh, Ontario, Candace Rice. And he's writing, Dear Candace, we were approached by Nectarina regarding this exhibit earlier this year when they asked for financial support and I have to say, we did not feel comfortable supporting this particular initiative. And then it's blacked out. We don't know why. Um, and it says, please see Frankie James' site, Fat Cat Canada's Giant Litter Box. And again, it's blacked out. 
And the reasons that are redacted uh, are for Section 15.1, and that's for uh, international security and the defense of Canada. So, very interesting. This is my piece. I'm just going to show you a couple of screens. Canada is a fat cat sitting on vast riches. So I'm saying, you know what? We are a fat cat in terms of the world, and we have to be responsible and do things right and respect um, the uh, Aboriginal populations that are living around the tar sands and being polluted by the uh, oil sands. This is one screen within my fat cat camp. Now, he, you know, I go, it's tempting to demonize and blame Arthur, but, you know, we, we shouldn't do that. We have to take responsibility of ourselves. Uh, now, I wonder if you can get more upset at your painting or at this depiction. <laughs> but the funny thing is that my, when my work is on the internet and it gets published in books and it gets shown in private galleries, the government can't control who sees it? They can't shut it down. And I don't work for anybody, so he can't call my boss and fire me. And he can't get it taken down. So how does he exert, how do they exert pressure? They do things like interfere behind the scenes uh, in um, my, what was supposed to be my European tour. And it was supposed to tour 20 cities in Europe. And it was like a huge opportunity in my life. And this is one of the screens from my um, story, Band on the Hill, which you can look um, online and see. Um, and it's the uh, curator is having a conversation with the cultural officer at the Canadian Embassy in Croatia. And the cultural officer, Latke, is saying, this is off the record. Don't you know this artist speaks against the Canadian government? And when, when I heard that, what is she talking about? I don't speak against the Canadian government. I might say I don't like their policies on the environment, carbon taxes, and climate change, but I don't speak against Canada. And then I was told, oh, Ottawa is very unhappy with your visual essay to the Prime Minister. So this is one of the interior spreads, which is actually just um, saying uh, what is what Environment Canada is saying, that the tar sands is Canada's largest and fastest growing source of greenhouse gas pollution. But somehow, you know, putting it forward in this way makes it more accessible, more dramatic, and uh, more <coughs> impactful. So I like to say, incredibly, I am being blacklisted for disagreeing with my leader's grand vision for Canada to become an energy superpower and use the sky as a sewer. I'm going to show you, this is the last letter I'll show you. Um, and this is from the uh, a senior trade commissioner in Berlin, Thomas Marr, who coincidentally used to be the ambassador of the Canadian Embassy in Croatia. And he has written a letter, obtained under access to information, with the subject line, Frankie James is your fault. So that's going to be the name of my next book. <laughs> and it's just, so much is redacted, again, for reasons of international security. <laughs> but we can, we've got a tiny little bit that we can read. And we can say, we can see, um, Ms. James, who has a green conscience and whose work sharply criticizes the men and women working in forestry and oil sands in our great country. So he's criticizing her for connecting uh, the, uh, for connecting them with me. So how can I fight back against the Harper government? It's huge and powerful and rolling in oil money. So uh, I'm on Twitter and on Facebook and people came forward and this nice lady started a petition on CARE2, got thousands and thousands of signatures. Um, my story got out into the press, it was in the Star, it was in the Ottawa Citizen, which was, and also Vancouver, Sun and a whole bunch, that whole chain, they actually uh, took the time to submit access to information requests at the same time that I did. And so it's just remarkable that even though the government was not telling the truth, 
um, eventually we got these uh, access to information documents. I got them on the same day that the newspaper got them. And they wrote, you know, that government officials killed funding for the Canadian artists and uh, that they were not telling the truth. And then the, we got, I got on CBC, and uh, that was a lot of fun, and uh, Tom Flanagan was on the show with me. So lots and lots of press, and so what do you do when you're blacklisted? I held a blacklisting party, and I had over 100 people come, and it was a lot of fun, and it helped to raise money for what I'm going to show you next. But what was really interesting is the people that didn't show up. So I had friends, family, and clients who didn't come because all of a sudden it was too controversial to be associated with me. And uh, these are some of the people who helped to uh, fund my um, art show, which uh, happened in Ottawa. I called it Band on the Hill. And uh, so this was one year ago, a lot of fun, right around the corner from Parliament Hill. And two days before the show opened, I got the access to information documents. And thank God I got them because the, uh, it was just, it was a miracle. It was almost so perfect, we wondered if it was a setup. <laughs> because I got them two days before the show opened. And they proved that the government wasn't telling the truth. And then that was 165 pages. And then over the course of the year, I've gotten 1,500 pages. Um, but uh, what the crowdfunding paid for was me to have a uh, show on a bit, they're sort of like bus shelters uh, in Ottawa, right around the corner from the Parliament building. There were six pieces in it. And this is one of the pieces from it. So we can see. Please stop blacklisting our environmental messengers. Artists and scientists are the planet's early warning system. And the CBC, Sun Media, tons and tons of media came out. And it was a big success and a lot of fun. And, uh, but I am continuing to have to, you know, publicize um, the news of this blacklisting because it, it's just, it's so important to get the message out to let people understand that um, this behind the scenes censorship is going on and it should not be. We have to, um, you know, they say that sunshine is the best disinfectant and that's the approach that I'm taking. So, I'm just closing out now, okay? And uh, this morning we took the train from Toronto. We're down at Union Station, out of the corner of my eye, I see this public sculpture over there, and I go, oh, just a second, we're, you know, we, we can catch the train, but I just want to take this photo, okay? So I walk over, and I take this photo, okay? And then I take it from another point of view, and it's like this, you know, male nude bronze sculpture right out in the public. Everybody can see it, and they're not covering it up. <laughs> it's like, oh my goodness. So why is it right that it can be out there in broad daylight down at Union Station and, you know, like, how does context change? So I, I think that that's what our discussion is about today. Because, I mean, it's just right there. <laughs> There's obviously a difference in uh, valence, you know, in, in texture as you go up. And when you run a little private gallery, and you're the owner of the gallery, and you're selling pictures, and it's your business, like a corner store, uh, there's an implied permissive, uh, it's an implied privacy and therefore permissiveness. I mean, if somebody who runs a small gallery can presumably do whatever he or she wants on the walls. Uh, but when, as you, as you spread that out into a, a, a situation where more and more people can come to, to, to your exhibition, people who may or may not be uh, equipped or, Experience with what they're about to see. Then there are conditions, I suppose, but they don't. I don't think they involve censorship. I just think one has to be aware that there are obviously going to be more people, probably, who are going to be, or potentially, will be upset by what they see. This does not mean at all that I think certain pictures should be forbidden to, to be in such shows or what up should be taken down. Nothing horrible like that. But it's only reasonable to 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 imagine. 
that there's going to be more trouble the more public the access gets. The whole point of art often is to create, you know, whether it's create controversy or at least create a discussion. It always has and been. I mean, what always worried me about things like county council grants is that artists were always whining about not being academic artists. It was terrible to be an academic artist. But as soon as you accept a grant, you're automatically an academic artist because you're making art that has, has been approved by the academy. Well, and you're, you're eligible for different levels of grants depending on where you are on the academic spectrum. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about being granted or not granted. Yeah. If you're granted, but, 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 but you get in that process, though. There's no question. I mean, that's the same as, you know, what do you, if, you're, if you're trying to appeal, if you're trying to win a jury show, Presuming I sit there and say, well, I want the recognition, so I better do some of those juries like that. It's still not my point. My point yeah. is that once you're grantable, you are an academician. That's what I'm saying. You're making and what's wrong with that? Yeah, but, but Nothing's but, wrong with that, but you're making publicly acceptable art. It's just hard to, to, to stand with one foot in the academic uh, establishment but, but camp that, and the yeah. other in the avant-garde camp and, and, and have the haughty pride that a rebellious artist has at the same time as being protected either by a teaching position or a granting system. You, you, know, you just can't have it both ways. That's I, that's what I, th yeah, but, but I think you know, if you're looking at something like camp council, the issue isn't you know, do you become an academic? It doesn't necessarily mean anything. It's who's doing the choosing. And you know, Canada Council jury is composed of people who are respected art people. And you know, shall we say independent of government is one thing. If the government decides that, well, you know, we don't like what they're picking, which has been what's happened in the Canada Council the last it's 20 years, you know, and so they start to say, okay, we don't want those type of people picking it. We want people who we like what they think. And that's when, and that's well, when you have a problem. No, the really interesting thing is, Frankie, I think that Gary, sorry, go ahead, Frankie. So, Bill uh, C10 um, has uh, been brought in by the Harper government, and Penn Canada has uh, issued press releases uh, saying how they have been opposed to it. And the things that they talked about were that uh, sort of, uh, the part that I think is most interesting here is that it was enabling the government to claw back tax credits from work which had received grants but was not um, deemed, you know, um, according to government policy, <laughs> right? And so some of the exam, one of the examples that the Penn Canada gave in their press release um, was that if a filmmaker made a film um, adv advocating a carbon tax, and this was in 2008, then they could get, um, you know, clawed back. Their tax credits could get clawed back. And, you know, ironically, in 2008, that's when I wrote that, um, that, that letter. Now, fortunately, I didn't need any, um, you know, tax credits, um, but it's just, it's a perfect example of how the government is trying to, um, you know, uh, censor work that they do not feel uh, fits their government mm -hmm. policy. Sorry, Nelson. I just found it interesting um, because you know it relates directly to this public discussion in that um, an important part of the Kingston of uh, the, the culture mandate is to increase public access to the to the arts, and yet the only thing to sign up for an event is that it you know, be participatory and free, and there's, there's very simple requirements, so anyone can, can sign up and do an event, which I think is great, it's amazing. Um, but it, it does bring up uh, another element that kind of worries me is the, the Arts Council as a co-presenter cool along with the city of Kingston, uh, just in the fact that like, well, what if someone does something, you know, that, that's really, I don't know, like offensive, like fill in the blank. And so I just found that interesting that here, culture is a national movement, just this open slate. Anyone can put forth an event, an, an, an something, and I don't know who the people are that are jurying this or, or, or so on. So I just thought that was an interesting context. And so, um, you know, the question, again, forgive me if this is kind of repetitive, but, you know, um, should there be limits? on what type of artistic activities are allowed to be included in this national event, Culture Days, and if so, how should these decisions be made and by who? If you're going to have something called Culture Days, then that presumably draws upon whatever the multi-complex, multi-faceted fabric of our culture mm -hmm. is. And therefore, I would think that by definition, whatever people wanted to do was a legitimate part of Culture Days, and I don't think you should worry about what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. 
uh, because then you do get yourself into a situation where you're saying this yes, but not yeah, that, exactly. which you don't want to be in. Yeah. Yeah, so. Anyone else from the panel, Frankie? Well, so I did a little bit of research on the censorship, because, I mean, like a year ago, I never thought about censorship. It just wasn't something I thought, I just thought well, you know, I'm free to speak my mind, who cares, you know, it's whatever I want to say, right? But over the last year, I've understood the censorship is really important. So I thought, uh, the, I looked into why and who is allowed um, to censor stuff, right? So we've got bodies like Human Rights Council, um, the CRTC, broadcasters, um, who censor work all the time. And we accept it, right? Like you go to a movie, <coughs> and it might be R-rated, it might be PG, and we all accept that that work has been you know, pre-screened for us, right? So the difference here is that the gallery didn't pre-screen um, the uh, nude harbor, which I like to call it. <laughs> but, 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 the but, jury, but the four jury members who did. But they did pre-screen. Yeah, yeah, there was, was a pre screen Sorry? I mean, there, there was pre-screening. I know, but the library didn't. Have no, the library screen. didn't. She's right. There wasn't a public communication system. Uh, very exclusive well, pre-screening of four people. Well, listen, I, I thought you said the policy where the library board reserved the right to review everything was brought in the year before. It, it was, but when we were, when the Kings and Arts Council were usually working about a year in advance. Yeah, so kind of coincided. Yeah. Oh. yeah. 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 Slipped under the radar. Right? But the interesting <laughs> thing is, in terms of why things get censored in any community is that they, um, they make up certain rules. So they say, okay, this is going to be in keeping with our morals, you know, and how we want the, you know, people to think in our community. And that's why they have these, you know, sort of rules on censorship, right? So it's not something that is, you know, um, dark and nefarious all the time. Always dark in the <laughs> <laughs> so When people yeah. decide that they are going to be the arbiters of your personal taste, I think it's incredibly yeah. dark. As, in the as long as you put the artist in the position where they take the responsibility for their work, you know, we do have laws about pornography and so on and hate, hate and so on. If they want to say, look, I don't think that is that, and if I get charged, I'll fight it, that's fine. See, that's what yeah. would happen if, if, in answer to Greg's worries, if, if, if there were a, a, a culture, openly accessible yeah. culture days, and everybody did anything they wanted, and everything was accepted, exactly. there was no jury. Exactly. There, would exactly. be, there would be people who were angry, who were delighted, who were upset, who wanted to set fire to the whole thing. There'd be a whole range of... That's right. of and, and we actually would like to see is get, get, get mad at the artists and go after them in a public yeah. forum. Exactly. What, what happens as soon as you have censorship, and you know, we can disagree on you know, how broadly you define censorship is, that all happens in the back room. You don't hear it. You know, we've obviously gone a step further in this country where the government says one thing. You know, Harper's office's comment on the thing was, well, it's cheap. We hate painting because everyone knows Harper's a cat person, not a dog person. Yeah. But you know, if you follow it all, the sort of stuff they do about having lots of other people think about doing blogging on their behalf, yeah. you know, I'd be willing to bet that a lot of the complaints that came in originated out of their office. Well, the interesting thing is, like, if that hadn't been Harper, if that had just been a man, if it would have uh, received so much controversy. And How can we, and I mean, if you look at all the people in this room, uh, artists, curators, uh, members of the public, how can we advocate for freedom of artistic expression now and, and continue to uh, in the future? Um, any comments? Frank, do you want to start us off on this? I think it's really great that you've allowed this forum to, um, you know, to generate discussion and this is, this is wonderful. And so I was trying to think, well, I wonder what it would be like if I was in charge of coming up with the library policy and what would I do? And so I Googled, you know, other libraries that have got policies on, you know, how they decide what the guidelines are. And I thought, you know what, it would be nice if you could do it in such a way that you can still, that you allow provocative art to be shown. Because let's say that there was an exhibit that was about eating disorders. That would be a provocative and disturbing show to some people, but it would also generate a lot of valuable discussion. And it would be a real shame to not allow that type of thing because you want to be so safe in your policy that nothing controversial goes on the wall that basically you get like pictures 
which are just meaningless art and should be just decoration above somebody's couch and their wallpaper. And, and so, like, the type of art that I love is art that has meaning and has uh, social, a social message to it. And so I would hope that you draft your policy in such a way that you say, you know, this, we're going to allow stuff which um, is going to push at you and is going to poke and prod people in the community. And, you know, maybe it means that um, little kids, you know, only come in with their parents um, and, and are, are guided. PG art. You know, <laughs> maybe. Um, but this is, uh, this is just a wonderful opportunity because you've got art and books together in one place. Mm. We, we also sort of suffer from a culture-wide assumption that children are innocent. <laughs> <laughs> Strange idea now, uh, considering that children have been open access to the internet mm -hmm. and, uh, get, and are highly conversant with every form of human diversity and degradation by the time they're six. Uh, it's it's a, a, a strange concept that we're, it's not easy for me to see what we're protecting them from and we get all upset about it. families, their mothers and their children being horrified. It's hard, I think probably the older the generation, the mother, the grandparent, the easier the, uh, easier the outrage comes. I think uh, we're being a little silly to get all protective about kids. What concerns me with a lot of what's happening, and obviously Frankie's been put through, you know, the, the, fear, the fear, fear machine. I would think any public gallery in this country is probably sitting there saying, well, we accept mm -hmm. Frankie's work, mm -hmm. or are we going to see all our funding cut off as soon as we do that? Right. And you know, to live in a country where that type of environment is being created over art that clearly is not pornography, it's not hate literature, it's not doing any of the things that we consider to be criminal, and yet it's getting hit with a sledgehammer that's far harder than we'd ever hit a pornographer with or someone with hate literature. You know, it's just a, uh, sort of an unacceptable situation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's true. It's every not, citizen's duty to fight for something. It's not usually about imagery, is it? It's about attitude. Yeah. Uh, the imagery is probably a red herring, uh, the imagery of a so called offensive work of art. I was watching just by the sheer merest accident last night an old movie starring Woody Allen called The Front. It wasn't written by Woody Allen. It's about the uh, uh, House of Un-American Activities blacklisting mechanism in the early 50s. Uh, the front is about uh, four writers who can't get published because they've been blacklisted for espousing communist sympathies, and they get poor Hapless and Woody Allen to be the guy who goes in and pretends he's a writer and sells their script. But in fact, it's, uh, we've forgotten how horrifying, how widespread, how damaging that movement was during the McCarthy era, and that's what this movie is about. But really, the government said, uh, you, worked, you, you, you marched in the May Day Parade four years ago, you can't get work anywhere, you have to do something else. Uh, it was horrifying, and uh, I didn't, I, I'd forgotten how horrifying until I saw this film. It's sort of relevant, in a way, to this discussion. One thing that I would say that I find really fascinating is you know, when we see these kind of controversies erupt, the voices that are loudest are the ones that are taking exception, and then people say, well, that's silly, but then there isn't the same counter voice that comes forward. Right. So from a, a policy creation point of view um, and in the public realm in terms of discourse and discussion, I think those who support need to be as vocal as those who yeah. oppose. And so yeah. <laughs> I think that you know, was missing in the 70s with the public art. It was missing with discussion around this situation that you know more people get more ink and more yeah. air time to oppose than those who support and, and I always wonder well, where are those voices yeah. are we just sitting back feeling superior that we don't actually have to say anything right. because oh, that person's ridiculous but, but people so. who have supported things have always been regarded as sort of bland you know uh, I remember when I was writing for the Globe Mail uh, it was clear that if I enjoyed something and wrote about it in an attractive supportive way Nobody gave a damn. Right. Uh, but if I had a bad a fit of temper that day and decided to really dislike something, it was infamous the next day. Yeah. But I would just like hope that when you're making your public art policy or revising it, you give it some like teeth, because giving the giving the power to a community board, it strikes me as they would have so much discretion to do whatever they want, and I don't know what the process for getting on that board would be or how you would. Cool about doing that, but like, I don't know, like, what if the Christian right took it over, you know? <laughs> so I would just be, you know, the Christian right are people too, and that's okay, and they do their thing, but I don't want them dictating what happens in the library. And like, say that I don't want the like, random environmentalists like myself dictating <laughs> what happens in the library. So I'm just 
just a little worried that like it's a bit too discretion and a bit too um, <laughs> Give it some content. Um, that's my recommendation. And my other, my other comment is that like public art is private art, or private galleries, or the gallery that has to run like a mom and pop business, and the library, and like Soul Peppers Theater's decision to not run the student commercial play. It, it just seems to me that everybody has to battle the money god at some point. And frankly, I'm fascinated to hear from you just because you're so tough. And <laughs> mother and an artist and I had a, a piece on the same wall as the Harker painting um, and on opening night I really I didn't have any issues with either of my children seeing the painting and my 10 year old's comment which got in the paper somehow was um, <laughs> I didn't know Harker had a dog <laughs> at which I was very proud of that remark of his and then he noticed that all of the people standing behind Harper had their heads chopped off. So what my comment is that, you know, knowing a lot of parents and knowing a lot of artists and knowing a lot of children, um, I think the issue of um, censorship when you talk about kids and parents is really speaks to the fact that a lot of parents nowadays are used to 
being able to control what content their children mm -hmm. see. And unfortunately, I think sometimes they're more narrow-minded, in fact, than parents of the 60s and 70s and even the 50s. Um, and I think it's unfortunate because they've lost the idea that the art that some people are finding con controversial is actually an opportunity to learn what it is the artist is trying to say. And the thing I was most disappointed with all of Canada, and when I took a trip to Oakville and my mother-in-law's cousin was Googling the, your painting, she wasn't Googling it with the enjoyment of finding out what it was you were trying to say. It was just the whole controversy and the titillation of the fact that it was Harper. And he was nude. And I, that's what really bothered me about the whole thing. I mean, the censorship and the whole, you know, the, the cloud of the possible censorship really bothered me. But the fact that your meaning behind the whole painting was really just getting missed a lot of times. And that's, that was very kind of sad. So maybe you, I'd love to hear what you thought about all that, if you don't mind. You know, it, it didn't, it still was worth it. <laughs> the burlesque was, was um, you know, it, it came with the territory. I knew I could get answers no matter that. Um, I just, the thing that, that did stick in my craw was a certain amount of bureaucratic, lack of communication. And the, the, there seemed to be a, a, a real uh, disconnect between the artist, the arts council, the library board, and the library's own art committee, which didn't, s I spoke with two members and they seemed to be pretty well in the dark about the situation. I don't know if that was them or if this was not communicated. And the thing that, um, that I mean, there was a point in time, initially I was very distressed to hear that the painting had been taken down because I'd never agreed to that. I'd agreed to let them cover it. I didn't know I was supposed to provide them with cloth or noose. Um, Loin cloth. Uh, Loin cloth, you know, and so, you know, there was one point I was thinking, Jesus Christ, <laughs> <laughs> nobody wants to see my work. <laughs> and it's sitting in a closet somewhere and they forgot to put it back up. And so there was, a, a real lack of communication. You know, nobody expects the Spanish Inquisition, but <laughs> it was seen to be, they, they weren't prepared for the reaction there was, which I can't blame the library for. Um, I wasn't prepared for the scope of the reaction, but I was rather distressed with some of the offhandedness of some of the treatment of the situation. Um, so. Yeah, I think history is full of examples where censorship has completely backfired on the censor. <laughs> uh, from like Brian, I think it was 1979. Uh, I think the attendance, they, Monty Python couldn't have been happier. I think the attendance just went skyward. They all made extra money. During the 30s, the Nazis had their exhibition of deviant art, which just allowed people to go and see just how good it was compared to the crap you know, the Nazis had. Uh, I think a lot of more people saw your painting and know about your painting because of the fuss. Uh, I know it must have been emotionally traumatic for them to try and take a baseball bat to your career and your exhibition in Europe, but when you look at the organizational support and publicity you've gotten since then, um, I have to ask you both, except for the trauma, uh, was it a net gain in, in, in the end for your careers and for what you're trying to do? Oh, I'll respond to then. Jane, you had questions? Yeah, okay. Okay. okay, go ahead. Uh, I think that that's really interesting. I think the thing is that what I'm doing is making lemonade from lemons, mm -hmm. okay? And I'm having a certain amount of fun with it. And uh, I mean, this is the subject of great art. Censorship, this is fantastic. I'm having a lot of fun with it. Am I making money? Mm -hmm. No. Um, would I have uh, done better if I had a, sh a 20 city European show? Financially, yes. It was major, major, major. Um, I have taken a huge financial hit in order to do all of that promotion that you see to get the publicity to have the crowdfunded art shows and all of that stuff, right? Um, but, I mean, yeah. 
this is, it's an amazing time in my life. And, uh, you know, I'm just trying to make the, uh, make the most of it. Thank you. Uh, Maggie, do you want to respond or do you want to call Jane? Um, I, I think the jury's still out. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, sorry to interrupt. We should wrap up this, if there's any other lingering questions. Uh, Jane? Well, mine's just a quick question. Is the library going to pre-screen the 2013? No, I think we'll just continue like we've been doing it. Thank you. 